asked me to take part in this. It was based on uh, a workshop I had done at a local congregation on the role of music in worship. And uh, so if I was going to give a title to what I want to say today, it would be the role of music in Christian worship and how Christmas carols fit in. <laughs> so some of <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> So what are some of the roles of music in worship? First of all, uh, to nurture us and sustain us in our relationship with the holy while challenging us in our commitment and our discipleship. For many people, music is a way of encountering the holy. Secondly, music helps, um, it enriches and enlivens the scriptural message. From a United Church perspective, worship begins with the scripture. So if you're preparing a worship service, you start with the scripture and then out of it grow the call to worship, the children's message, the sermon, the prayers. Everything grows out of the scripture. So the the music is intended to enliven the scripture, to bring to life what the scripture is saying to us as contemporary people. The third role of music is participation. Um, music engages the individual, our bodies, we, we often stand, we uh, use our whole body to sing, we uh, engage our minds as we connect the words and the music, uh, our emotions are involved, and our spirits, that which is deep within us, are often touched by music. So the individual is engaged by music, but participation also is in community. In congregational singing or in a gathering like today, we blend our voices, we become one as we sing together. Another aspect related to music is memory. <coughs> in eras and cultures where people uh, didn't, were, if they were illiterate or are illiterate, then uh, the stories of faith often come by music. Um, in early days, the uh, cathedrals had stained glass windows that told the Christian story. Then, in, of course, in the Protestant Reformation, uh, we got into telling the story more through faith. Uh, John Wesley writing numerous hymns in the early Methodist, for early Methodists so that they would learn the whole Bible story. So during the year, you would have the whole story told in hymns, and, and, uh, <coughs> uh, and they were often Wesley would put them to the pub tune of the day because it was the one that was catchy and that everybody knew. So they were lively hymns that were easy to sing for people and easy to remember. The Presbyterians, of course, uh, only used biblical material in their singing. Uh, but the metrical psalms were, you know, they were pretty even, pretty easy to remember because they uh, were sung so often and they were uh, in an easy tone. So the, our forebears in faith learned the faith through the singing of hymns, particularly in, if they were illiterate. More recently, studies of the human brain show that music, the musical part of our brain is a different part of our brain than that which we use for rational thought. Mm -hmm. um, so people uh, with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia often will be able to sing um, hymns in perfect every word and in perfect tone um, because that part of the brain which uh, is a different part than the everyday kind of functional activities that we use in our daily life remains long after the ordinary activities and ordinary connections can be lost. So there's something deep, deep in our cells that holds the memory of music. And of course, along with that cellular memory is nostalgia. <laughs> A lot of us have hymns and music that we hold deep in our nostalgic being. Uh, we have memories of particular hymns or songs that are old favorites. Um, some of us might even be embarrassed to admit what those are. <laughs> uh, but we have old favorite hymns. Uh, and sometimes we're very clear about what the connections are uh, to why we're nostalgic about a particular hymn. Sometimes we can't articulate that. But if somebody changes a word or does something different with it, we know. Uh, it touches a button deep within us, and uh, it's, uh, it 
uh, bothers us. So uh, the cellular memory, the nostalgia, all of those things are deep. They're very deep in our beings, in our cells. And the final role of music in worship is theology. Well, there's lots more, but the final one I'm going to speak about <laughs> is theology. Our music teaches our theology. For many people, what is believed is what is sung. I'll come back as we talk more about Christmas carols. <laughs> so, what does all of this mean for Christmas carols? First, carols do start with scripture. Most of us learn the Christmas story from Christmas hymns and carols. We know the basic storyline of the Christmas story from the Gospels, but we know there were, uh, you know, um, angels and uh, a manger and, you know, all of those dimensions. But do we know which Gospel tells which story and why did the Gospel writers write them as they did? So uh, we learn our story basically from hymns, and then we mush them all. To, the hymns are all mushed together, <laughs> and we, but we learn the gospel story, the storyline from our hymns and carols. And the second thing that I mentioned was that uh, the role of of uh, music is to enrich and enliven the scriptural message. Well, we know that Christmas carols often enrich the uh, Christmas story. They elaborate in all kinds of ways and teach us things that may or may not be in the Bible. <laughs> so you think of the hymn, uh, Gentle Mary, Later Child. Well, we know Mary, we know the child, we know the manger. We don't quite know where the gentle part came from. Uh, it doesn't actually say that in scripture. Uh, so so we, we en enrich the story in our hymns. We Three Kings of Orient. Well, um, I'm not quite sure how we get from uh, some magi, magicians, astrologers, some unknown number of these characters, to three kings. Who knows? So we enrich the story. We make it more lively by singing the Christmas songs and Christmas carols. Many people do love to sing Christmas carols. I think that's why we gather today. Mm -hmm. Their familiarity allows us to participate individually and as a community as we sing together. Christmas carols are in our cells, particularly if we're of a certain age. I'm not sure that's going to be true in generations to come, but if you're of a certain age, you know the Christmas carols uh, from our culture as well as from our, our uh, uh, church activities. And we can usually sing some verses, at least one or two verses, by memory of many of the Christmas carols, and we can hum the tunes without having the music anywhere near us. <coughs> We're connected often to the carols nostalgically. We hold deep memories of singing them for years and years. And the song that we just sang, Silent Night, many people uh, in many congregations have that in their nostalgia uh, basket because Christmas midnight services by candlelight with Silent Night is a tradition in, in many Canadian churches. And so we're nostalgically connected to these Christmas carols. But then there is the theology. <laughs> Sometimes the, Christmas, the theology is fine. It's great in some Christmas songs and carols. But sometimes it's dreadful. And uh, I and many of my friends are avid about changing the words of hymns throughout the year to uh, include women and men, to try and rid the hymns of colonial and racist language, and we refuse to sing hymns that are atonement and blood-filled hymns. But at Christmas, <laughs> I hear a resonance. <laughs> at Christmas, it's easy just to give up and just sing the hymns and kind of let go of some of the problematic theology. 
theology seems to take second place to nostalgia. Or perhaps sometimes the carols do take us to a place where we simply encounter the holy. Thank <laughs> you.